All right. Good afternoon, everybody. Hope you're having a great pack so far. Mm -hmm. There we go. That's what I like to hear. So you are here for Leveled Up Learning. We're going to talk about games, gamification, and games-based learning. Um, a lot of it is in a college setting and then a little bit beyond. All right, so let us introduce ourselves. First of all, I am uh, Dr. Melissa Barlett. I am an assistant professor of life sciences at Mohawk Valley Community College, which is in Utica, New York, which is... Those are my students. <laughs> <laughs> but if you've never heard of Utica, it's east of Syracuse. So it's a place people know. So. These are, the, the loud shouts are mostly from the students of the Strategic Gaming Club who get to come to Boston. I advise them, and I also really love gaming as well as teaching, so a lot of this is because I like to combine the two things. Cool. Thank you, Melissa. Uh, my name is Dr. Dave Eng. I am a managing partner at University XP. I specialize in instructional design, so I help a lot of professors take their courses and put them online. I also focus on game design and experience design. Uh, and my background is mostly in higher education. I've, worked, I've been a faculty member. I've worked with uh, other administrators. And um, uh, I'm proud to say that I was able to finish my doctorate by doing my dissertation on board games. So that's why I'm here. I'm going to talk a little bit more about how I've used board games in the classroom specifically for learning. So one of the first things I want to talk about is higher education. So in the title, we talked about games for learning, games for education in general. Uh, and a lot of people have different ideas about what higher education is specifically. So uh, if you don't know, here's the very, very broad overview. So we're talking about colleges and universities and academies. And unlike K through 12 education, you know, like kindergarten, elementary school, middle school, high school, uh, higher education is going to be optional, formal learning. I mean, we're mandated to have students go through all the K through 12 levels, but they don't have to go to college. And the biggest thing, the one thing that separates a lot of K through 12 and higher education is that in higher ed, we are going to talk about theoretical learning. We want you to learn more about the theory of everything else uh, versus application learning. So application learning is going to be about how you apply those concepts in like a real world environment. Melissa? So I've been to quite a few PAXs and I always go to education panels and I hear a lot from K-12 teachers and some of it is really applicable to me as a higher ed instructor and some of it is not. So I want to talk a little bit about where this might differ between us and I don't teach K-12 so you can all nail me in the Q&A later um, but it's a significantly different system. Uh, in a lot of the K-12 classrooms you have to have structured plans Teachers are communicating consistently with their students. There's a lot of feedback. You're talking to the people in your classrooms where a lot of what's happening occurs. The students are typically of about the same age group. They typically live in about the same place. And they mostly kind of have to be there at least up until a certain point. So higher ed takes things a little bit outside of that framework, which is also a shock to students a lot of times when they switch gears in that, first of all, I don't have to have quite as structured a learning plan. As long as I cover just a few basic concepts, my classroom is an open space to do a lot of whatever I want with. So I have a little bit more flexibility to work. Most of the time college, you'll notice I picked the picture of the lecture classroom, guy way down in the front and millions of students up in the back, and I've taught in one of those rooms, and it's a tough space to communicate with people and to give feedback and to get students engaged. So college is a little bit different sometimes. I also expect college students to do a lot of learning on their own, two hours outside of the classroom for every hour inside, which is a difficult thing for people to get to. There's a lot of variation. I teach at a community college. My students age in, range in age from about 16 to the age of my grandparents, and sometimes all in the same space. So it's kind of an interesting group. And they don't have to be there most of the time for some reason or another. So getting the engagement is a little bit different. And also getting them invested in what's happening can be a little different. So, we want to make sure we're all on the same page with some of our terms that we've figured out where we're at in education. We want to figure out where we're at with games. So what is a game? You can define a game in a lot of different ways. I like sort of an 
oversimplified version of it's a game, if it's got rules, you get to make a choice, and you know what the goal is at the end, and preferably how to win. But you don't always get to win. Sometimes games just end. So that's an important point. And we also then associate games with doing something fun, having some enjoyment. Not every game is fun, but that's the intent, is to have the rules and the choice and the goal while enjoying yourself. So now I want to talk about gamification. And this is one of those things I studied before. So um, can I just get a show of hands? Who here has a credit card that earns you points? All right, so a lot of you. So you already participate in gamification right now, because getting points through your credit card are one of the ways that life is gamified. If you have a Fitbit like I have right now, that's another aspect of gamification, getting steps, earning badges, competing against other people. And then airline reward programs are another form of gamification. Like if you travel so many times, you get to become like a King Sky member or something else like that. That's recognizing you for different achievements with a real world outcome. And those are some applicable means of gamification. And so the concept that we're probably going to focus the most on here is games-based learning, which is actually using our games as a learning tool. It's not just for play or enjoyment, but to use a game in a way that somebody can actually learn some kind of material or a skill or something interesting. So I actually break these up into sort of two categories. One is using a game to learn a skill, as in you're picking up some kind of concept, but not specifically content. And when you're dealing with games in education, one of the important things is trying to figure out whether we're actually getting across learning objectives in our games. And so a skills-based game might have a learning objective such as can learn all of these items and then memorize them and spit them out later, or can follow a particular strategy. Whereas a content-based game is really to say, did you learn the steps of this process or did you learn these facts and pieces of information? And they kind of fall in very different ways. When I talk about my content-based games, one of the things I tell people is I want to make games where you don't have to already know the material to enjoy the game, but you'll learn it if you play. So our whole point here, of course, is to combine these concepts higher education and gaming, two of my biggest passions in one place. So I do that in my classroom. So first of all, gamification is probably the thing we see in the classroom a lot. I like to take game-based elements and put them together. Tell my students all the time that if you take my class, my class is a game that doesn't necessarily make college any more fun, but it does make it sound more fun, at least briefly. But there are things we can do to add the game elements into the classroom. So instead of a standard system of whether or not you earned 100%, 90%, or 80% on a test, you earn a number of points. And then you can earn more points, and you can level your way up from a C to a B to an A by gaining points. That would be a game element in my class. I reframe a lot of my class by calling things missions. My students don't finish chapters, they go on a mission to accomplish a goal, and they have a bunch of those that they need to do. And then we have boss battles. Now, some people actually just take boss battles and call it whatever their test or exam is. I've taken mine up a level. So in my classroom, if you have an actual boss battle, I have a scenario or an idea that I present to my group of students, and they have to solve it. So I think my favorite, my general biology class, has to walk through a it's essentially a dungeon crawl at the end of general biology. They start as a group and they have to travel down this path and then they suddenly meet a bunch of plants. I think my favorite one is they, they look for these nice ripe tomatoes and they grab the nice ripe tomato then suddenly the great big bad tomato plague comes after them and then they have to answer a bunch of science questions to destroy it. So. And they do that two or three in a row because, you know, you can't just have one boss at the end. You've got to have a mini boss and then a slightly bigger one until you defeat the climate change at the, the back end of the whole thing. It's quite an adventure. So, then games-based learning is actually bringing games into the classroom. So, most of, a lot of times when people start with games in the classroom, one of the things you start with is Jeopardy. Jeopardy is indeed a game. 
you learn it, it's great, it helps students study their material because they know if you're playing Jeopardy and they do not show up knowing things, they are going to lose the game of Jeopardy. And so, I like that, although if you've got a student who doesn't know their stuff, they're not going to do very well in the game of Jeopardy and might help them learn a little bit, but I don't think it's as effective as teaching content, but it will help. Other games that you might recognize that sort of fall into this category, um, so we're going to need to play the video off the thing. Mm -hmm. If you're, you know, my age and you remember watching Carmen San Diego, you had to get the little things in the right spots on the map when they tell you where you go. But if you don't know a little bit about the countries on that map, you're just blindly guessing. So it's a good game. You'll probably, if you play it six or seven times, eventually learn the spots on the map. But I like to, to take it up a notch. Now I do use skills learning when it's useful. So I teach a college success class, and in my college success class, we play the game of college, because college is definitely a game. And so my students have to actually play this game. They get into groups. They have a little person. Their person has to like get by financial aid and take placement tests, and then they have to work their way through a semester at a time, making choices like doing homework and getting things accomplished, trying to earn money so they can buy books, while life is also throwing random things at them like having babies and losing their car in the middle of the semester and then they gotta figure out what they're going to do. And I brought my, one of my physical copies of it if anyone wants to see the game of college later. Who here has seen this game before? So Melissa shared a lot of her experience teaching in the classroom. I wanna tell you a little bit about mine. So one of the classes I taught to freshmen was public speaking. Now, if you've never taken a public speaking course before, I can tell you, most of my freshmen are scared to death. They would rather do anything else but get up on a stage and talk about themselves. That is, until I introduced Werewolf to them. Because one of the types of speeches we would always cover is persuasive speeches. And if you've ever played Werewolf before, one of the best parts about it is telling other people why you should not die. <laughs> And that's exactly what I did. I told them, listen, our learning outcome here is that I'm gonna help you better speak in public. And I want to do that through persuasive speech. With that being said, here's a little game called Werewolf. And I ran through all those roles, and we did the night face, and we did everything else, and then I had them play. And then the very first time they played, everyone just died very quickly. <laughs> because what they didn't realize at that point was that to win at the game of Werewolf, you want to stay alive if you're a werewolf and tr try to kill as many other players as possible. And then if you are a villager, you want to try to convince other people who are a werewolf. So what I told them is that uh, after the first classroom uh, like example of the playthrough, I just told them, listen, I don't care whether or not you win or lose a werewolf. This class is not Werewolf 101 for freshmen. This class is public speaking communication arts. What I want you to do is I want you to try to convince as many people in the class as possible why Johnny should die <laughs> or why you should live. And really that's the thing I want you to focus on. We're talking about persuasive speeches. So after I told him that, I got a lot of, oh. All right, so we played that the next class. And guess what I found them playing outside the classroom? They were playing werewolves in their dorm rooms. They were playing werewolves, werewolf in the student union. Uh, everyone was accusing each other. It was great. And the best part about that was that even the quietest students in my class were getting up there and they're trying to find really good reasons why they should live or they should eliminate another player. And I told them, at the end of the day, again, I don't care whether or not you win or lose at werewolf. I just want you to be a better public speaker. And that's how I've used it in the classroom. So sometimes your content is just a little bit specific and esoteric and nobody has yet made a game for you. And what I'd like to say is that if you're here, you're probably interested in games, you're probably a little bit of a gamer, if not a lot a bit of a gamer. And so I suggest you try to make your own game based on your own content. And so I've done that. I've actually done it a bunch of times, but this is a particular example of one of the ones that I like the best. And so I need to go over in my biology class the steps of respiration and photosynthesis. It is a bunch of metabolic processes using a bunch of really annoying molecules and structures and things move and things change. And it is probably one of the more difficult topics to teach to introductory students because there's a lot going on. 
So I turned the whole thing into a game. In this particular case, I decided that it was a game about steps in a process, so they had to follow the steps in the process. And again, I don't want them to know those steps ahead of time. I want them to see how they work together and where things happen on a grand scale. So in this game, you start as a photon from the sun, essentially, you're the light energy that begins it, and then you jump from molecule to molecule, which is pretty much similar to what the electrons do in the process. They're jumping from place to place. In some cases, what's happening is you're gaining energy, and so you pick up some energetic materials like ATP, but later on, you need to give them up to get through another step of the process so they can see in a broad sense where they're going, what molecules are involved, where the energy's gained, where the energy's going to be, and how the whole thing shakes out in the end, since their goal is to get to the end first and make the ATP. And then somewhere in the middle, there are some carnivorous plants that eat other plants and steal all of your ATP, or it's a cloudy day and you can't move for a little while, and there's a bunch of other sort of mini attack cards in the middle of it. But what I really like about this too is that, I mean, I went to like Target and bought a bunch of supplies and put this game together. You don't have to do something fancy to make it work. My game of college is a little bit nicer. My marketing department helped me make that one. But you can just make stuff, put it together, print things out on cardstock, give it a try, and you know, make a game that covers your content in a way that gets the students involved. So in my general biology class, again, I don't always know who's on top of it, but when they're playing the game, they have to sit there and think about what process is coming next. What cards do they need? What molecules are going to be coming up? Which ones can they use from one previous process to another one so they can plan effectively? Now, in some cases, you do get lucky, and there are existing games in this. There are some existing games in I kn that I know exist, but I don't know because they're not my area in, for example, history and things like that. There's a bunch of that kind of stuff. This one actually exists in my field. I could use this in my class. Cytosis walks through the steps of protein and lipid production in a cell, and it's actually pretty good in terms of the science. So if you were looking for a starting point kind of game, you're not quite ready to make your own, uh, this is a, a pretty good one. I've had this in my possession for a couple of years now. And so we talked about a lot of games and gamification and learning inside the classroom, but I want to talk a little bit now about how we've used it outside the classroom. So one of the things I want to talk about is gamification, but how can gamification be used for good? Uh, who here has heard of either Chore Wars or Habatica before? Okay, so the interesting thing about this is that Chore Wars and Habatica is supposed to get you, to incentivize you, to do things you normally don't want to do. So one of them is chores, and if you've ever, ever read uh, Reality is Broken by Jane McGonigal, she talks about this. Because honestly, who wants to clean that part of the toilet in the very back that no one wants to clean? No one wants to, but if you get 1200 XP and 12 gold out of it, I might want to do that. I might want to clean behind the toilet there. Habatica is kind of the same way, but it kind of expands on that a little bit because it really incentivizes you to change your habits. And if you're someone like me that likes to emphasize productivity or anything else, I try to tell people, you are not really your goals, and I tell this to, your, to my freshmen, you're not your goals, you are your habits. You are the things that you do every single day or every hour or every minute, the things that you talk about. And Habatica is one of those applications that helps you develop really good habits. Again, I'm going to talk about this too. When it comes to fitness, gamification has come out in force with Fitbit, Photocracy, and IMAP My Run. I am a Fitbit evangelist. It's helped me become more fit, so now I don't huff and puff whenever I have to bring in groceries in from the car, and I can do all of it in one load now. I couldn't do that before. Uh, Photocracy is really great because not only does it give you some examples on how to work out, but how to work out best and how to work out to best meet your goals. And IMAP My Run is great because if you've never used it before, you can and use it to track your run or track your bike ride. But if you ever played Mario Kart, it also provides a ghost runner there for you. So now if you think you did this run really well, well, Johnny9253 did it like five one hundredths of a second better than you. So see if you can beat their ghost in IMAP My Run. 
And then one of the last things is digital badges. And this is something I talk to a lot of faculty members with in higher education about where we're going from now on. Because at the beginning, it used to be just you go to college or you go to university to earn a degree. And that was your quote unquote badge. But what we're seeing right now is that students will enroll in classes, sometimes adults, sometimes people that have families, and they can't spend 120 credits. So they can't spend four years in the classroom. Well, what they can do is they can spend a weekend, they can spend four weeks, they can spend 10 days, they can learn a competency, and they can earn a badge. And that badge represents something that they've learned, something that they can do, and something that they have mastered that will help them in their career, in their personal life, or whatever they want to do after that point. So, I mean, in general, learning is real hard, but it's way more fun if you can find a way to make it a game. In some cases, an actual game, in some cases, parts of a game. And I know from having been at PAX for a number of years and going to lots of education panels that there are lots of you out there who either are interested in doing this or have done so. And so we really want to have a conversation with you guys as well about what you've done, what you're interested in, or if you want to hear more from us about the stuff that we've done. I could probably talk for, you know, two hours about chemical bonds and biology and the game I built around that. But if you don't want to hear that, don't ask. Oh, also, if you want to download this presentation or just get our contact info, you can just point your smartphone at the screen and that QR code will take care of the rest. Um, but we open it up right now to any questions if anyone wants to ask them. Yes, sir. So I'm... Okay, give our, our people the uh, soundboard a second to... That's all right. You can probably hear me fine. Yep. So, um, I teach at Western Governors University, and mm -hmm. we have primarily older students, not as old as the uh, grandparents' age that you were talking about, uh, though generally speaking, 35 to 40 year old students. I'm kind of curious, which is not to say that 35 to 40 year olds aren't interested in games, but I'm curious um, how you've presented the gamification to more students on the further end of the age spectrum uh, if it's had a similar kind of uh, uh, reception or if it has been, you know, dismissed as sort of kid stuff uh, or if you had to make two different pitches depending on where, uh, where your students are. <laughs> on the whole, I find my students very much enjoy it. So the class that the, the class I teach the most picks up a lot of returning adults. It's a little hard to gauge the average age of my class. The average age of our college is in the high 20s. Um, and so we're already in a, a pretty spread out zone. But I'd say I end up with a good chunk of the 30 to 40 year old students. Uh, a lot of them are coming back to do human services and psychology type work. and. It's always a momentarily kind of shocking, like, wait a second, you want me to what? But most of the time, selling it is, is kind of an inherent part of what I do. Selling any aspect of biology is a kind of an inherent part of what a biology teacher does. But you, you get the idea of, hey, if you help do this thing, you'll definitely learn this process. And so if we're talking about the gamification aspect, I do what I call a mini boss fairly early on in the class, where in my, my human life science class, the students are sent on an alien expedition where they find various elements on a planet and they come back. And usually after doing it, they get it because it walks them through, oh, I had to figure this out and I had to figure that out and I had to solve this problem and they kind of come back to me and get the idea. There, there is sometimes resistance at first and I have heard almost every semester I have somebody who says I just don't like games and I'm like, okay, I'm sure that's not entirely accurate but we're not going to have this discussion, just give it a try. <laughs> And then they kind of jump in and go for it, even with the, the board games. But I also offer, um, for some of my stuff, especially when I'm building a new board game, I very often offer extra credit for showing up playing and giving me a little bit of feedback. And so those five extra points probably did not actually change their grade that much, but every student will pretty much jump in and play my game for five extra points. 
And you're at Western Governors, so you're pretty familiar with competency-based education. I'm having flashbacks as well. <laughs> <laughs> so competency-based education, unlike other education, like traditional higher ed is very much based on seat time. Like if you sit in that seat for 12 hours a week for 16 weeks, you will earn X amount of credits. Competency-based education is more focused on what can you do. So the way I've addressed it, and I, I, I have to uh, say that I haven't taught a lot of adult learners, but going back to my freshman class, I tell them in this public speaking class, in week number one, guess what? You all are making a speech. It's going to be a five-second speech. You're going to tell me your name and your hometown. And that's it. So we build on that competency, and then by the end of week three, they're doing 30-second speeches, 60-second speeches, five-minute speeches. So I start them off really small, and then we build up to something larger, more complex, like playing werewolf. So that's how I've addressed it before. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, sir. Uh, so um, <laughs> I apologize in advance if I, I ramble a little bit with this question. I'll do my best to uh, keep it concise. So uh, I'm a PhD student in education, in, in mathematics education specifically. And um, when I uh, tell people that I'm interested in researching games and learning, um, I get reactions from people sometimes. And I, I think there's. Um, the term sort of gamification in particular has, I think, come to have a really negative association in, in a lot of math education spaces. And uh, I think there's a, there's a critique of sort of gamified approaches to learning that I, I think is actually pretty kind of well-founded and that I'm gonna sort of try to make it here. So basically, when we, in like math ed world, we talk a lot about what can we do to create learning tasks that are more open and more, you know, admit multiple different strategies and kind of center the learner's own, you know, sort of skills and experiences and, um, you know, kind of be used, you know, how can we have tasks where math is used to sort of model things that are of interest and, and, and sort of all these different things and which in a lot of ways seem to me to have some very sort of game-like qualities but a lot of how gamification has been used in math learning context really pushes against that, right? So it's much more like solve a problem, get 10 points, solve another problem, get 10 points. And so what, what you're seeing is it's really taking basically just sort of drill worksheets and like superimposing this sort of superficial game structure over the top rather than really thinking like, what are the actual sort of game-like elements of this thing that we think is worth your time to learn? And what that does is it, it sort of does two things. First of all, it kind of admits that this is, this without the game, like this is boring, right? It's, it's like sort of, you know, again, it's like, it's, it's like we have points for like cleaning your toilet, right? So it's like, do we want to be sort of saying like learning math is like equivalent to like cleaning your toilet and that both of them are things that we need this kind of external incentive to do, right? Like we wouldn't be interested in doing them or want to do them without the game laid over the top. And then the second thing is that it says basically that there's, I don't know, like it, it, it keeps the game sort of very like separate from the learning in a way that I think it's, I don't know, like I wonder about So I, I guess I'm just wondering what are your thoughts about this? Do you see this as sort of mapping onto your like content versus skills framework at all? Like, like, how do, you, how do you sort of make sure that you're not um, losing the intrinsic value of like what you're trying to teach as you sort of turn it into a game? Uh, so I'd say feel free to study games. When I told my, my advisor, I was like, I'm going to write my dissertation on games. He was like, that's not the strangest thing I've heard. Yeah. So he gave me the green light. Yeah. Second thing is that um, the way I studied it was yeah. not games, but more experiential learning. And if you, yeah. if you don't know, experiential learning is learning through experience. You do it now with internships, externships, study abroad, outdoor adventure, anything else like that. And that's how I approach it. And I think um, uh, uh, math education is really important because uh, it's not something you learn by just understanding the theory. Like, I can explain the theory of, exp I'm not very good at math, but I can explain you the theory of exponents. Yeah. But if I can use exponents in practice to achieve a specific goal, that's where I've used experience. And I'm sure Melissa has something else she can add to. Yeah, so, so I, I'm, 
uh, was an educator first before I started putting the game elements into my classes. And I firmly believe that when you are doing anything game related in a class, that learning objectives are actually the first thing you need to start with. What is the thing you're trying to get the students to figure out? And then from there, how that learning process would happen before you ever get to the game part. And I think that's one of the problems, that when we gamify things, sometimes we skip those first two steps and jump to the thing that sounds like it would be fun or easy to figure out, which is why, if you couldn't tell from my conversation earlier, I'm not really a huge fan of Jeopardy, because I think unless it's done really specific ways, it doesn't promote the kind of learning that I want Whereas I, you know, have created different kinds of things. And so I think one of the problems with math is that, yeah, we associate, and math especially, we associate with edutainment and, you know, frog jumping math equations and stupid things like that. And math does indeed have intrinsic value, and I think it could that there are ways to use gaming in that, and that a lot of them have been done very poorly without starting at that beginning point. Because also understanding how we learn is an integral part of it. One of the things that works with gaming are concepts like scaffolding, starting with those little things and building up. That's a game concept that we don't even think about in education until we try to connect the two things. Then it's like, oh, no, my students are doing stuff like that, but now I want them to see it that way. So I just, you know, reframe the, you learned this little thing, but wait, you need that little thing to do this big thing, and you need that other thing to do this thing, and pretty soon you're in the middle of a game of Mega Man trying to figure out which weapon you need to defeat which boss. But that's a different concept than the way we currently do it. So does it exist in really poor forms? Oh yeah. Do I think that eliminates the possibility? Should we throw it all out? Probably not, but. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. Hi. So I'm a game designer that's actually studied gamification. Mm -hmm. And I think that jumping off of the previous point, a lot of what's missing in gamification is that we focus very much on creating games that have educational content rather than looking at the psychological values and needs that games are providing that education may not. And you know, pulling out the game concepts that allow us to feel and engage with our content, for example, maybe immediate feedback loops, uh, gradual progression, and things like that and competition are, are elements that they want to see in education and have been proven very effective in online education. For example, Khan Academy, Hacker Rank, you're seeing a lot of people engaging and gamifying their content to teach incredibly well, more effectively than in the classroom. The problem is that oftentimes you see that these concepts are antithetical to the lecture test paradigm that you see in college classrooms. So how do you remedy where there are proven gamified concepts like, you know, very rapid amounts of quizzes with no, you know, necessary bad feedback if you, if you fail them, graduate progression, immediate feedback loops like that, with your classroom where you don't necessarily have the ability to change how you run well, so that's that's one of the higher ed benefits. I do have that ability. Yeah. And almost every college professor in some manner does. There's some things we gotta do to, to make it work. There are some assessments we have to give. But on the whole, one of the ways I work to defeat this is by trying to convince my colleagues that lectures with three tests every semester is the worst possible way to teach any subject ever. Now, it's slow going. I've been at it for eight years now, and I've probably only talked about like 10% of my school into you know switching it up. But every time I do, I get somebody new sort of on the, oh, maybe I'll try that thing. Maybe I'll do something different. And I do think higher ed is moving in this direction because all the neuroscience of learning and all the stuff we're picking up tells us that what we've been doing, what I did when I was in school and stuff like that, isn't working. So I think slowly we're, we're getting there. Uh, I also but. think that uh, some people hear about gamification and they'll just want to do it. And that's when you get like, oh, we should put in points, we should put in leaderboards, we should put in badges, and the TF2 guy's like, we should have hats. <laughs> you know, like, let's just add all this stuff, then it's gamification. <laughs> yeah, we need hats. And right. it's like, then it's gamified and everything so will be good. <laughs> 
but really, like, um, uh, Melissa made a really good point. Like, what is the learning outcome here? I am the kind of person that will say that sometimes having a lecture might be your best bet. I wouldn't put up a 60-minute lecture online, but sometimes just being didactic and just explaining what needs to happen. Like, I'm, I'm a board game player. I play a lot of tabletop games. Sometimes with tabletop games, you just got to sit and explain the structure of this game to someone. Yes, there are some games where you can be like, we're just going to play. Other games, like, I'm going to have to explain this to you, otherwise it, making moves makes no sense. So you kind of have to play it by ear. Thank you. Very Thank much. you. Sir. Approaching uh, adult learning from a corporate context, um, I'm looking for, because you, you already answered some of like, the questions that I had before with this answer, so uh, will be some resources for instructional design uh, to introduce game elements and uh, principles to group learning discussion? You first. Oh, yeah, you go. <laughs> um, okay, so one of the, so, also did work as an instructional designer. Uh, one of the, the big things I, I just tell a lot of faculty members and subject matter experts is to scaffold. So what are the main learning outcomes for this course or whatever you're teaching? And then what are some things you need to know first before you can tackle the bigger learning outcomes? So scaffolding is one of them. The second thing I talk about is um, progression. So when students progress through this class, how are they doing it? Yes, they, they meet these individual competencies, but how is that reinforced? And fr from a, a game design perspective, I'm always thinking about what is the core loop? Like in tic-tac-toe, the core loop is that you're always gonna place a piece and once you have three in a row, that is the end of the game. That is your feedback. Like if I put this piece here, am I in a better position than I was before? Yes or no, and then you go from there. So that core loop has to be really evident for students. And the last part is, this is especially important for theoretical courses, but if you're gonna teach me the theory of something, how can I apply it like right now? Like if I'm gonna learn about the Battleship Potemkin, how does that change my life? How do I put that into practice? Like how can I engage in some degree of active learning? So those are the three things I talk about. Um, uh, scaffolding, progression, and then some sort of pro uh, some sort of active learning activity. And I, I think the thing I would add to, to it is again with the concept of learning outcomes, when you're doing corporate stuff, you also want people to understand what their goal is and how it's going to be effective for the mission of the company, the job, the actual thing, not just a leaderboard of did you accomplish whatever five tasks we want you to accomplish today, because those have been shown to be ter absolutely terrible in corporate type situations. But if what you're using makes sense as in you're gonna gain something out of it, that's kind of a key. Thank you. Yes? That's okay, I don't think it's on, so. Oh. Yeah, we're not even sure about that. Yeah, it's not on. It's not like, oh, it's not on? Well, well it's fine. then I'll just speak loudly. <laughs> um, so, uh, I'm a UI UX designer at um, an online learning company, mm -hmm. and we're developing like online learning platforms, custom experiences for nonprofit, higher ed, and, um, cor and just corporate training. Uh, one of the things that we definitely kind of struggle, and we're local, by the way, um, one of the things that we definitely struggled with is, you know, obviously people coming up to us and being like, hey, we want to gamify this thing. And um, I was wondering what your thoughts are on, you know, how much is too much gamification to where it's like, you know, kind of the bad gamification of like, it's just a leaderboard and that's not great. Or, you know, let's build this game, it's going to cost a lot of money. Is there, um, what are your thoughts on, is there also a way to make online learning and gamify but in a way that's, affordable and how much is too much? A lot. A, that is a lot. Yeah. That is a lot. It's like, uh, it's like you asked us what the meaning of life is. <laughs> no, no, I know that one. Oh, it's 42. But, like in your courses, right? Yeah. Like how do you know how much to gamify and do you just choose? Okay, so in, in my classes in terms of how much to gamify, I'm not gonna lie, a lot of it has been trial and error. As in, I try to see, you know, I see an element that I think based on what I know about game mechanics, which is a lot, because I play a lot of games, seems like it would fit into a mechanic that I could gamify. And then I give it a try, 
And in some cases it goes really, really well and I kind of keep going, and in some cases it doesn't. So I actually, just in the end of, I talked about the idea of leveling up in class. I've actually moved away from that in my class because the way I teach has gotten me to a place where leveling up didn't actually make sense for what I wanted my students to accomplish. I want them to complete an aspect of a mission. That became the thing that worked. So I changed my methods and it, it probably feels even a little, it feels a little less gamified than it did a couple of years ago. Although the game elements are still underneath. So I've, I've done a little bit of that. It's really, I feel like it's very, gonna be very subject specific and group dependent. It's, it's hard to say who's gonna take gamification and like run with it and who will work better on just, just a couple of little elements to push them. <laughs> and then it, you know. I would also say, when I've talked to faculty members in the past, I'll say, here are some concepts that I, uh, of gamification I think you could use for your class. I want you to use as many as you feel comfortable and as many as you feel meets the outcomes of the class. Because I tell them, like, the worst thing that can happen is you feel totally uncomfortable gamifying your class and you just don't want to teach it. Because if you're not comfortable as the as the expert, the subject matter expert, especially introducing these new concepts, it's not going to be comfortable for your students. So mine is much more of like, a casual, uh, less formal answer because it's what, what are you comfortable with? If you just want to have points and it fits your class, great. You don't have to go anywhere past that. Thank you. Yes, sir. Yeah. Uh, I'm not from school. I'm just a random guy that just wanted to listen. Um, from Missouri. But I've heard a lot of examples from, you know, board games and just, uh, just tabletop kind of stuff, but what has been your experience with uh, PC games and simulators and the effectiveness of those? And maybe if you could give some positive or negative uh, times where you may have tried to use them or if you've ever used them. So. For me, board games has been the easiest thing because I don't have a lot of immediate access to technology that I can get my students on. And they don't always have a lot of access to technology either. So one of the things being a community college in central New York is I can't guarantee, I can't even guarantee every student in my class has a smartphone at any given time. Um, most of them do, but I never really know. So I've mostly, honestly, stayed on the further end from that. I'm not against those. And if I had a class where I could get everybody into a space where I knew they had that stuff, I would do it. And I've done some, I suppose you could actually call this sort of like electronic gamification where I've created like Google Forms that lead you through something where you like bounce to the right and wrong answers and stuff like that. And, and it gets you there, but I can't, I can't, I don't have that access. I think it would be great. <laughs> yeah, I, to be honest with you, I use mostly tabletop games because I'm not a developer. I can design, but I'm, I don't have a, like a programming or coding well, background. Stuff like Kerbal Space Program, mm -hmm. like um, stuff like that that's out there. Oh, I think some of it is yeah. out there and it's probably pretty good. Yeah. I'm pretty sure my husband has learned more about orbits from, from Kobolds than, than absolutely, and he is an English major. So, you know, anytime he talks science with me, it's like, well, that's cool. And I, I definitely recall learning almost everything I know about the layers of skin from the original, uh, I was going to say Nintendo remade it. I can't remember the name where you had to like operate on the patients and cut through each layer one at a time and <laughs> stick all the true. little cauterizers yeah. in the thing. And, and it was back in black and white when I played it. And I killed a lot of patients because they bled out in a big <laughs> black blob. So I have anecdotal experience that I think those things can work. I just can't try them on a scale. My short answer is I'm just <laughs> waiting for Ready Player One to become a reality. <laughs> that, that'd be awesome. I hear flight simulators <laughs> do very well. Yeah. Also, just last thing, uh, I think the the light whatever you had the light thing that was like candy brush or candy race or whatever. I think that would have been really interesting to make it into a fan. Or you know what I'm talking about? The light as a plant. The plant. Oh. Thing. Oh. Oh. Power plant. Oh, my, my plant more, game. Uh, yeah, making that more into like a Catan, like where there's exchange of carnivorism. Mm -hmm. against other players. That, that would be a really cool concept for, for a game, for sure, of, of you know, resource exchange in, in ecosystem-based communities. I'm going to work on that one now. Thank you. <laughs> yes? So right now at my company, we're trying to gamify a couple of case studies for interns, where they're split into groups, and we want each one of the interns to learn a lot while cooperating. 
What we don't want is one intern in the group with maybe a little more experience or a little more knowledge taking control of the group and then winning the entire case study mm. for the group. So in cooperative games such as your dungeon crawls, what elements do you add to reduce the risk of one party member carrying your entire group? I'm not going to lie, that is an area I'm still working on pretty significantly. You're talking uh, about the quarterbacking problem. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But, but the, the few things that I, that I do, um, I have, I mean, in my class, I incorporate points as part of are you participating and being involved. I've created a situation where they can only have one speaker and then they all have to feed information to it. So if I can kind of get that person to be someone who doesn't know everything, sometimes that works. And I've worked on the idea of feeding pieces of information to only certain players, specifically the quieter ones in my class, that will be useful to them later, but they don't know it yet. But no, that is a hard problem, and I am definitely still working on it. Yeah, that's interesting, because usually when I work <laughs> with, um, you know, like if you've ever done a group project in college, it's not the one person that's trying to do everything. It's like the three people that are doing nothing, and then show up the day of, and are like, let's do a presentation together. I did nothing. So I, I don't know. Like, it, it's an interesting challenge to solve, and I just doing a lot of reading online, I hear that Spirit Island is, is definitely like the cooperative game to play right now. And it, for some reason, it helps solve this quarterbacking dilemma. So I guess my goal right now is to buy Spirit Island and try yeah. it out and see what, what works and what doesn't. From a class perspective, my thing is that I have some really group activities and some really individual activities too, and I figure they balance. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> yes, sir. So um, being a student, I have played some, some games in classrooms in middle school and elementary and, uh, and high school, elementary school, but they've almost been exclusively for review purposes. Stuff that we've already learned and just kind of just going over again for a test or something. Uh, I've even had some teachers say that games uh, aren't really good for learning something new because you're too distracted by the game aspect and not really retaining anything. How do you get that to like, the information to be retained when you're doing these um, games and other game aspects in the classroom. So, neuroscience rule one, you don't actually retain anything the first time. That's actually an inherent part of learning, is that one of the things you have to do is go back to something again and again and again and repeat it. So one of the things I'm actually trying to do is get them interested enough in what we're doing to, in fact, go back to it again and again and again. So one of the aspects of learning from a game is that you've got to play it a bunch of times for that to work. Learning works on a you know everything and then you forget everything and then you know a bit more and then you forget a bit more kind of curve. And so part of it is, is doing a little bit of that. So no, I don't actually expect the content to uh, smash the first time through. Sometimes the games that I use, uh, I've taught them the content and then we're using it as not to review, but to further solidify how it works. So they've seen those things, but they don't necessarily remember all those molecules, but then they go back through it. Yeah. yeah, and for me, like going back to my public speaking class, like my class didn't know the first time they were supposed to convince people to kill Johnny. But the next time around, they got, they understood the purpose of the game, even though they forgot about the learning outcome, which was to be better persuasive speakers. So for them, it was very much about returning to that core loop and playing the game over again. Thank you. Yes, sir. So we already touched on this a little bit with the quarterbacking issue. Mm -hmm. but, um, so I'm a high school math teacher, mm -hmm. and one of the biggest issues I have is I've tried to implement games in the classroom, and whenever I design an activity, I have trouble balancing um, for students who don't have a lot of knowledge and students who have a lot of knowledge. Mm -hmm. So I'm just wondering if you can give a little bit of advice for when you're actually building an activity, how you balance for students who have different levels of content. <laughs> well, yes, well, there is a little bit of that. Well, and, and then you can also design, so some of it when I say the content-based games, right. they're designed with the idea that nobody has to know the material to play through it. Mm -hmm. But then they talk about it more, and they're in the material, and they do a little bit like that. So if the activity is designed around you, you know, it will walk you through it, and it will get you where you're going. That's one starting point. But then also, if they are forced to work together, they can, teaching each other is, is not something I am against. I very often try to stand over here and kind of be like, oh, what does that you said? You should say it louder to the people around you. 
Yeah, and sometimes I just I scaffold it differently. Like I've also used code names in my classroom before, and I also want my students to talk to each other because we ran into an issue where like one of the one of the cards was like Himalayas, and one of the students didn't, I didn't know what the Himalayas was, so their group like talked about it and you know said it was a mountain chain or did something else like that. So for me, sometimes it's about developing a competency first, then addressing the content, and sometimes it's a content first then the competency. So it really depends on what you're teaching. Okay. Yes, sir. Hi there. Hey. Thank you guys for giving this presentation. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm part of a uh, careers office at local university. Mm -hmm. um, from that, uh, we're looking at using games to maybe teach professional development. Um, problem that we run into, I, I have two questions. The first one is we have a problem with we don't have a captive audience. Mm -hmm. So do you have suggestions for enticing people to play a game that you would make in that situation? Mm -hmm. Um, you can't force them to. <laughs> just, just for clarification, um, who is said it's for professional development? Who's playing these games? Students. Okay. okay, so students like learning about future careers or about career skills. Uh, that part of it, yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, professional development covers a whole lot, so it's kind of just life skills in general. Okay. Okay. So it's but it's students learning skills for for professions. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> We use those words differently in my world, so I was just trying to connect all of those pieces. Yeah. Uh, I, I used to be a director of student activities, so the simple one-word answer would be pizza. Yes. Uh, it's a good answer. Other than that, um, I think in this case it's harder because, like you said before, it's for professional development, so they don't have to be there. I know because I've worked with colleagues in career development before. I think an interesting part would be how do you address how, how can you address something that they can do that they can use instantly. So it may be about, say your learning outcome is like networking or how to like, how to um, you know, connect with others. But in order for someone to do that, they also have to navigate maybe you know, difficulties in communication or public speaking sometimes, or, or sometimes even just um, how do you negotiate like awkward conversations. So for me, it would be, you know, like let's not, let's not address this head on and be like, let's, let's create a game about networking. Let's, how about we first create a game about how to have a sensible conversation with someone else. Because to be honest with you, I've had some students before where that has been a significant challenge in their life. So for me, it would be, you know, what, what is the quote unquote pain point for a lot of your students right now? And how can you develop something that helps them address that? And how can you pivot that into addressing it for professional development? And, and I mean, I hear you. Your office is the one on my campus that I'm also always trying to get my students to go talk to and they're just like, no, we're cool. We don't, we don't need those people. And I'm like, no, but for real. So in your case too, I wonder if working within, because one of the things we're trying to implement and I think would be great is more things within our disciplines where we can get the people who know the stuff, the people on my end who like do the life science and then get the students who need the skills to get the life science job all in one place so that they can do that, relating it back to what they're doing. And, and then it can be nailed into a discipline specific, again, you know, learning objectives that make sense. And with any change, you could also then use the sort of networking to create the buzz. You know, if you create something that they like, and they're like, no, I use this and I learned something useful for this thing, and then they let the next person know, mm -hmm. a lot of times, you know, that's, that's what gets our students to go do whatever is cool, and I'm not sure what that is. They'll have to tell you, you know, what gets them to go to stuff. And kind of just a follow-up. Mm -hmm. Is there a list of games you have suggestions for for professional development? Werewolf was a great example. I'm going to steal yeah. that. I'd love to steal more. Um, <laughs> just like basic communications games. I, I've used code names before because that, that was just a very simple like party you game. Know, leadership is an important topic. Mm -hmm. uh, I've used pandemic before. Yeah. You know. Um. I mean, you could, you know, you try diplomacy, know but uh, it's always you can. You can choice. also contact us up there on the okay. screen, or we, we can trade cards after this. Okay. Oh, I know that. Yeah, I've got a bike. <laughs> yes, sir. Hi. Um, a stark memory for me is uh, having really, really boring history classes, mm -hmm. and about the, at about the same age, uh, just like eating up everything I could read of like. Forgotten Realms history, whether in like the Campaign Guidebook or in Neverwinter Nights, and do reading the Endless World of Warcraft and uh, Oblivion, like books that are just scattered around. 
And I really wonder, I, I still don't exactly know like what it is that makes those, like the history of those worlds so much more interesting than the history of this world. Um, but I do know some of it is just uh, like the way it's presented, right? The, the history classes in high school were presented the worst way. Um, so I was wondering, though, since, since some of that is information, which I don't really know how you could possibly uh, transmit it through something more engaged like a board game. Like, no, really, they're just like, as you said, sometimes you just have to talk for 15 minutes. Um, do you have any thoughts uh, on like, ways to, uh, like, possibly with games as a structure or like either end, make a block of content you have to force feed people more interesting? I mean, you're never going to be able to do it with everything. Sometimes it's a block of content. But I mean, anything that you can separate out and make into something. I always, when I, I sometimes I give these kinds of presentations to academics, and one of the things I, you know, ask them is, you know, you don't remember probably the names of like, you know, the last ten mayors or representatives or like people in your area, but you could probably name all the characters and clue. <laughs> I name all the characters in Clue. And that's a chunk of physical information. And so there's always some ways to figure out which pieces of information can get embedded into something. And then again, you've got what I said before, which is that the first time through the game, nobody's going to learn it as content. But the first time reading it in the book, they weren't going to either. So I figure it's, it's sort of a little bit of that. But you can... I mean, one of, the, one of the keys of education is you really actually can't gamify absolutely everything. Yeah, which is a travesty. Which is really a travesty, but... Uh, and I would also say, like, some that, like Melissa said, it doesn't always need to be gamified. Sometimes, like, I always rely on experiential learning. Like, if we can learn about this content through experience, I prefer to do that. Like, one of my, one of my best memories was learning about, you know, colonial America and then vi vi uh, visiting... Um, Williamsburg, Colonial Williamsburg in, in Virginia, just because I got, I'm not just reading it in a book. I get to experience it, I get to see it, I get to see how people during that time period lived. And that's not necessarily a game, but I was also learning through experience there. Thank you. Uh, so I think I'm getting the stink eye over here, so this yeah, is the end of our time. <laughs> uh, if you would like our contact information, you can just take a picture of the screen, otherwise you can use your smartphone to just uh, use that QR code and get a copy of this presentation. Uh, we want to be respectful of our next presenters, so we're going to gather all of our stuff. We're going to go over here, and then um, if you want to trade business cards or anything else, we can do that. But otherwise, thanks for coming, everyone.